Okay, let's get this started. Um, it's a gigantic room, so don't hesitate to move to the front. And don't be shy. <laughs> Not everyone at the same time. Um, this is the last talk of the day, so I'll try to make it brief and, and entertaining. Um, so hello everyone, thanks for coming for this very late talk, last talk of the Wednesday, th day three. Um, my name is Thierry Carrez, I work for the OpenStack Foundation. And today I want to talk to you about what makes OpenStack relevant in a containers world. Um, as part of the introduction, I want to talk about the confusion we're setting out to clear here and introduce a cast of characters that will help us, help us through the, this discussion. Every now and then, uh, a new technology appears, and as it appears, it creates confusion as people try to wrap their heads and strategies around it. It was OpenStack coming to mainstream in 2011, uh, containers in 2014, Kubernetes in 2016, and every single time uh, this confusion arises. Every single time, the new technology is set to replace everything else, like uh, obviously, because it's so much more convenient to think that a single technology uh, can solve all of the world problems. So the rise of containers and container orchestration systems created a lot of confusion, especially with respect to OpenStack, which was like the previous uh, uh, hot technology. Like if, if containers are replacing VMs and, and OpenStack being VM-centric, does it mean that OpenStack is not relevant anymore? Or um, uh, why would I, on earth, would I deploy OpenStack if all I want to do is cloud-native stuff? Or for people that actually understood that those were different technologies, there was still confusion as to whether OpenStack runs containers or is it like running on containers, like mixed messaging around that? So lots of confusion. And this is, these are not theoretical questions. Those questions I hear all the time. Uh, I, especially in like container-oriented conferences where people like ask, well, why is there an OpenStack Foundation booth here? Like, uh, why, what are you guys doing? Aren't you dead already? And, <laughs> And so I, I receive those questions all the time, and I try to, to put some words into the usual explanation that I give to uh, clarify it for a lot of people. Um, to help us through this, I want to introduce a set of personas. Uh, personas are a tool used in user experience studies. You basically put a face uh, and a profile on, on a typical person. You describe his life a bit, and that helps uh, explain uh, the various stakeholders and why, why would they care about one thing or another. Um, so I want to introduce three slightly overlapping personas. The first one, uh, let's call him Dinesh, is the application developer. Dinesh uh, writes the application that runs your business and he cares mostly about speed. Speed to design, speed to develop, uh, speed to deploy, speed to market. He also likes to use the latest tools, um, not only because it makes him more efficient, but also because it keeps him on the edge and uh, ever relevant in, uh, on the job market. So that means today, Dinesh is looking into 12-factor applications and serverless technologies. Dinesh doesn't want to care too much about infrastructure. Um, he wants to have uh, the differences. He doesn't want to deploy any server. He doesn't want any difference between is a development environment, his test environments, and his production environments to introduce interesting bugs in his applications. And finally, Dinesh um, does not obsess too much about cost or lock-in. He loves to use AWS, finds it very convenient, um, and, and is happy with it. The second persona I want to introduce, let's call him Bertram. Bertram is the application operator. Bertram handles the deployment monitoring and scaling of the apps that Dinesh writes. Obviously, those are slightly overlapping personas. In some companies, the Dineshes and Bertrams are sharing the same desks and offices. But um, in, most, in a lot of companies, those are slightly different roles. And we'll, we'll see that they're, they have like slightly different um, um, priorities. Uh, like Bertram cares a lot about performance and reliability, most, more than he cares about speed. 
Um, he's the one that is on call, so he wants solid and proven tools. They don't want to be called at 10 p.m. on a, on a Saturday because, because everything uh, caught fire in production. Bertram does not want to micromanage infrastructure, but he still kind of wants to look under the hood to understand how it works. He still uh, wants to understand enough of it to be able to select the right technology. And uh, finally, Dinesh is concerned about lock-in uh, because he likes to pick the best technical tool and being locked in kind of reduces his options. Uh, our third persona, uh, let's call him Ehrlich, is the infrastructure provider. Because like even in serverless, someone has to rack servers and that's Ehrlich's job. Uh, Ehrlich could be operating public cloud infrastructure and be offering infrastructure resources to anyone around the world with a credit card, or uh, it can be operating a private cloud infrastructure and be uh, offering infrastructure services to uh, people that are within a given organization. That doesn't change that much his role. Um, Ehrlich doesn't want to care too much about specific workloads. He really wants to provide generic programmable infrastructure for uh, Dinesh and Bertram to uh, be able to do their job. He cares mostly about cost. That would be his primary metric. Uh, he also cares about evolution, the ability to change uh, uh, his systems in a way that makes uh, uh, his systems relevant uh, for, for uh, anyone that comes next, like for the Ehrlich and for the Bertrams and the Dineshes of today, but also the Bertram and Dineshes of tomorrow. So that's it with the cast. Those are our three personas. Uh, now I want to introduce the various technologies. What are containers? Um, containers are at base a packaging format. It's a convenient way to package your application together with libraries and dependencies. Um, it's also a pretty nifty deployment tooling, a uh, very convenient one, that um, you can use to deploy those applications in relatively isolated environments. What uh, Docker really created is, um, is bundling those, those uh, namespace and, and control group kernel technologies together with that convenient tooling to make those, uh, those tools really accessible to everyone. And with, with the success of Docker, you've seen also the, um, um, the rise of uh, application marketplaces as more and more companies publish their applications under containerized formats. So if you think in, in like Debian terms, you, it would be the combination of the dev packaging format plus the apt uh, tooling for deployment plus the distribution repositories where you can like basically draw uh, packages. And as such, containers are extremely appealing to Dinesh, right? Because uh, that allows him to package his applications together with all the dependencies and libraries. It makes sure that um, it shields it, uh, his applications from the uh, operating system intricacies. It guarantees that he can use uh, the application on, in development, test, and production in, uh, without introducing crazy bugs thanks to the, uh, the isolation that um, the, the container technology provides. Um, Kubernetes, now. What is Kubernetes? Well, it's one abstraction level up from containers. It's uh, a, a, a way to describe your application uh, using groups of containers, the role they have in the, in, in, in the application, how to scale them, and, uh, have the, have the, and have it deployed and maintained semi-automatically. So in a way, it's a deployment platform for containerized applications. What makes it great is that it captures operational best practices out of Google's experience um, and, and embeds it in the way you have to describe those resources. And finally, it, it's also pretty good at managing application lifecycle and scaling. So you can uh, scale, up, scale up and down based on demand, but you can also uh, handle things like holding upgrades, uh, to introduce a new version of your application. And as such, Kubernetes is really appealing to Bertram. Um, Bertram loves Kubernetes because uh, it encapsulates operational best practices and it's also pretty solid. Um, it's open source, so you can, you can look under the hood. It can be run on public or private clouds, so you, you can basically be free from lock-in. So that's uh, pretty much the tool for, for Bertram. 
Um, so containers are great for Dinesh. Kubernetes is great for Bertram. Nothing is great for Erlich. What, what does Erlich want? Erlich wants to provide programmable infrastructure for the Dineshes and the Bertrams of the world. Um, he, at that point, he has, he has two choices. He can, he can go specific infrastructure or he can go open infrastructure. Um, the specific infrastructure choice is if Erlich is dead sure that everything that the, the Dinesh and Bertram will ever want is containers and a container orchestration system, like containers and Kubernetes. They're dead set, they will use that forever. Then there is little value in for them to uh, necessarily deploy it on top of OpenStack resources. Um, he could go and deploy directly a Kubernetes cluster onto his bare metal servers. Um, or he could opt for an open infrastructure. What is, what is an open infrastructure? Uh, open infrastructure is when you want options. You want to give uh, Bertram and Dinesh access to uh, containers and container orchestration systems, but you also want to give them access to VMs, to bare metal machines, to Mesos clusters, to uh, Docker Swarm clusters, uh, and you want to provide those options with shared networking and storage. Like if they want to combine VMs, containers, and uh, other things, they have to be able to communicate and, and store and access data. You also want to provide advanced services like uh, object storage or database as a service because that makes Dinesh more efficient as it doesn't have to, um, uh, to like reinvent object storage or that makes Bertram more efficient because it doesn't have to uh, uh, micromanage databases in, a, in, a, in, in the environment. Um, you want multi-tenancy um, because you want to be able to properly isolate the various uh, people that are using your system and properly account how, for how many, how much resources they actually are using. You want interoperability um, you, you, so that they are not locked in, you're not locked in with a given provider. You want beyond interoperability, you want bursting. You want the ability for those extra days in the, in, in the month where, where uh, there you have like that extra need, you would want to be able to burst your capacity to a public cloud available that will be able to absorb it. You want scaling to millions of CPU cores. You want seamless operations, so you like things like common uh, log file formats or common configuration file formats. And beyond that, you want whatever comes next. You want the framework that you deploy to be able to uh, um, be used to integrate the next technology that Dinesh and Bertram will want tomorrow. You don't want to reinvent and reinstall everything for the next technology that comes up. And that's basically what OpenStack provides. Um, OpenStack, some people equated it to VMs, but it was never, uh, it was always more. Like OpenStack goal is to give um, uh, the infrastructure provider the way to answer the needs of the application developer and the application operator. So you want programmable infrastructure. Um, you want like VMs, bare metal machines, containers, container orchestration engines, not just Kubernetes, but also support the others. You want open infrastructure, the ability to plug services, uh, additional services as, as they become needed within your, within your environment. You want interoperable infrastructure. You want compatible clouds that you can burst to. You want future-proof infrastructure. You want the promise that the framework you're deploying today will still be relevant tomorrow as that new technology that will come next that nobody knows what it is will, uh, w will need to be integrated. Because like, make no mistake, there will be something else. Um, like Kubernetes and containers are not the end of infrastructure technology. They are coming every five years. We have a new thing. It's just, and, and the idea that OpenStack is that it's a more of an integration engine that will be, be able to reuse the same framework to uh, uh, capture that technology tomorrow. Let's go into practical examples. How am I doing with time? Uh, not too bad. So how can you, what, what type of OpenStack project would you deploy to answer various use cases? The first use case is uh, the case of raw resources. So those square at the bottom are supposed to be servers. Um, some font issue here. Okay. 
are raw resources. So you want to basically provide access to raw resources. You get VMs or bare metal machines. You deploy uh, Kubernetes on that, and then you can deploy your containerized applications. Um, for, to do that, you would deploy that kind of a stack. Uh, so Keystone for, uh, for authentication, Cinder for, blo for uh, block storage, Neutron for networking, Glance to store the disk images, and Nova to provide the VMs that, uh, that you would, you would um, uh, get those basic resources out of. If you want bare metal machines, then you also deploy Ironic to uh, uh, drive access to those bare metal machines. So that's like the most basic use case. You just provide raw infrastructures and someone else's job to uh, deploy Kubernetes on top of it. If you want to have directly a, a Kubernetes cluster, um, that's another use case. That's more of a container orchestration engine as a service thing. So you, want, you just want directly to have Kubernetes without having to deploy it yourself. And uh, in that case, what you would deploy is uh, um, the same stack with two more projects, Magnum and Heat, Heat for orchestration, and a Magnum uh, to provide this container orchestration engine as a service uh, system. Um, but at that point, you might say, well, I just want to run a container. I just, why, why, why are you deploying this Kubernetes cluster for me? And I just, like, there is this thing on Docker Hub, and I just want to run it. How, how do I do that? Do I have to instantiate a VM and, and, and then install Docker on it and then, and then run whatever command on uh, whatever? Well, we have a solution for that. Um, so what you basically want is OpenStack to just absorb your container and run it. And to do that, we have a project called Zoon. Uh, Zoon actually uh, lets you run any container and will provision uh, a bare metal machine through Nova and Ironic to run it uh, uh, for you, and, and you can kill it when you're done. Uh, just like it's, it's really as simple as Zoon create the name of the container on the Docker Hub. One thing to note here is that all those options um, are backed with shared networking and storage. Um, so Courier bridges uh, neutral networking features uh, to, uh, to containers, uh, letting them access the same kind of networks that are accessible to, uh, to VMs. Uh, we also have native Cinder volume support in Kubernetes, so uh, you can mount block storage directly in, in Kubernetes pods. So you basically can, can rely on having common shared networking and storage resources to back uh, all those, uh, all those uh, uh, solutions. Um, the last one I wanted to mention, because we had keynotes uh, on, on Tuesday that were uh, explaining that it would be great if we pushed more for uh, individual OpenStack projects to be reused in other stacks. And um, so if you just, what you want to deploy is Kubernetes, but Kubernetes also needs uh, identity management. It also needs uh, access to block storage. It also needs access to networking. And you might want to leverage uh, all the, the, the drivers that we, all the, all the drivers and, 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 and plugins that we developed within the OpenStack community uh, and give them access to it. So how do you make sure that Kubernetes doesn't prevent the wheel and uh, how do you leverage those projects um, to, to uh, provide those functionality? And there is a project called Stackube um, that is uh, emerging right now and it's being, it's being proposed to for OpenStack inclusion and, and it basically bridges between Kubernetes and those three projects by uh, providing plugin uh, to Keystone, Cinder and Neutron. And um, one other benefit is that it's a truly multi-tenant Kubernetes installation. It uses hyper.sh technology to uh, properly isolate between the various, uh, the various tenants. So it, it's basically a Kubernetes multi-tenant distribution that, uh, that, that reuses a number of OpenStack components. It used to be called um, um, something else. Hypernetis, thank you. Okay, so now that you get where every technology fits and what, how you can run containers on OpenStack, we will 
change everything. And how do you run, why, why, why do people say that we can run OpenStack on Kubernetes then? That it's different. Um, and this inception is what I want to talk about. So you have to realize at this point that OpenStack is a complex application. Uh, it's lots of scale out microservices. Uh, you just uh, like add additional nodes to cope with the load. Uh, the deployment is very complex because you have all those different moving parts. The um, upgrade is difficult because you don't want to cut user access to the resources while you are upgrading the system. Um, and uh, so the, the idea of a substrate, a deployment substrate to handle that complexity of deployment and of upgrade, that orchestration of the OpenStack application is, is not a new one. Like we've been exploring, especially running OpenStack on top of OpenStack with a, a triple O project. Uh, so we would, we would run an OpenStack uh, under cloud and, and use it to deploy the rest of the user accessible uh, OpenStack uh, over cloud instance. Now, if you, we get back to the technologies of what containers are, a, a packaging format, convenient deployment tooling, well, it sounds like it could be useful to uh, deploy OpenStack. And, I'm oh, sorry, um, like we could use containers as a packaging format rather than relying on distro packages. Uh, we could use that convenient deployment tooling to simplify the deployment of OpenStack. We could publish uh, those, uh, those OpenStack uh, packages in, uh, in packaged format. And uh, we have a number of projects that, that are exploring that space. Uh, OpenStack Ansible uh, is deploying OpenStack in, uh, in fat containers, like OS-like containers, uh, using Ansible. Uh, Cola, the Cola, original Cola, the one that is uh, using Ansible, uh, is deploying OpenStack in like Docker, Docker containers uh, using Ansible. Now, if we get back to what Kubernetes is, um, um, it's so a deployment platform for containerized apps that encapsulates operational best practices, also uh, manages the application lifecycle and scaling. Well, that sounds, it sounds like it could be useful to deploy, upgrade, and, 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 and maintain that OpenStack application. And um, if, especially to simplify scaling, to simplify rolling upgrades, we could run OpenStack on a Kubernetes substrate. And it's something that a number of projects are exploring. So Cola Kubernetes is a variant of the, of the Cola, uh, in the Cola family, uh, OpenStack deployment framework using Docker containers deployed onto a Kubernetes substrate. There is also the OpenStack Helm project, which is an unofficial uh, OpenStack project that is a, uh, has a, a collection of, produces a collection of uh, OpenStack Helm charts that you can deploy with the Helm client onto a Kubernetes substrate. So two slightly different approaches for the same problem, which is uh, leveraging Kubernetes to actually deploy OpenStack, the OpenStack application. Okay. Um, in summary, containers are a packaging format with nifty tooling answering the needs of application developers. Kubernetes is a best practice application deployment system answering the needs of application operators. OpenStack is an open infrastructure framework enabling all sorts of infrastructure solutions, answering the needs of infrastructure providers. Containers can be run on OpenStack providing infrastructure, allowing them to share networking and storage with other types of compute resources in rich environments. Kubernetes clusters can be deployed manually or through a provisioning API on OpenStack resources, giving their pods the same benefits of, of shared infrastructure. And finally, operators of OpenStack can leverage container and Kubernetes technologies to facilitate their deployment and management of OpenStack itself. In conclusion, those are different complementary technologies. Thank you. And we have plenty of time for questions. Sorry? The previous slide, do we? Sure. Um, sure, I'll, I'll post it in my Twitter feed.
No questions? Well, thank you for your attention and have a great day with OpenStack.